So you're thinking about leaving the rat race of the big city and head out to the country and buy yourself a piece of land. Whether you're buying the land in Utah or another state, there are many things that you need to know. And I'm gonna share with you everything I know on this video. Sometimes it can be an easy process, sometimes it's not. But I'll share with you some of my best kept secrets that no one has ever told you before. So let's get after it right now. Whether you're joining us from Utah or around the country, welcome to the Living in Utah channel. I'm Mike Gallagher. I'm a local real estate agent right here in the local area. This is your first time to my channel and you want to learn more about the state of Utah, you may consider tapping that subscribe button down below, hitting that bell notification, and you'll receive an alert every time I release a new video. And honestly, we've been helping people all over the world buy or sell real estate right here in the local area. We absolutely love it. So if I can be of any assistance, give me a call. Shoot me a text, send me an email, seven days a week, we got your back when moving to the U state. So when you're looking to purchase land, I would start with a blank sheet of paper or maybe an Excel spreadsheet. Make various columns. In column number one, put the address down. Column number two, put the size of the property. Is it one acre, half acre, four acres? In another column, list has there been any kind of tests or surveys done on the property recently? Another column, has there been any kind of improvements to the land? Has it been grubbed off? Has old vehicles been taken off the property? Have the trees been removed off the property? Make another column, list in the county that the land falls under and the city, the jurisdiction. Also, make another column, list in, has the four corners of the property been marked. Do you actually know where your property lines are? Then make another column for zoning. Is it residential, commercial, agricultural, etc.? And then the last column, put price. Then underneath the columns, make a comment section. List the pros, the cons, and any observations you notice when you're at the property. Is there a fire hydrant anywhere nearby? Is there electrical? Is there plumbing? Is there water? And this will help you break down each piece of property and you won't lose track. When you start looking at 10, 20, 30 pieces of land, it can get a little bit confusing. When you're out looking at a piece of land, you have to know, can you be on this particular road? Is the road part of your property? And who maintains the road? During the winter months, if you're living in northern Utah, who's responsible for the snow removal? And if it's a gravel road, who's responsible for the upkeep of this road? You get rain and snow, it can wash away parts of the road. You can end up with big ruts after the winter months. And to keep it maintained, you may need some sort of construction equipment, a backhoe, a tractor, a bobcat, to repair the road every winter. You can either do it yourself or hire it out. Another thing to look into, is it a shared driveway? Which would be a driveway that is owned by two or more people. It's not one of my favorite situations. It actually gives me the creeps. There's all kinds of situations that can arise, like who maintains the driveway, like I just mentioned earlier. Can you put a gate on the driveway? If it's a gravel road and you want to change it from gravel to say asphalt or concrete, who is going to pay the bill? And the question that I think about all the time, what if you don't get along with the other owners of the driveway? You may get along with them right now, but as time goes by, five, 10 years down the road, you may no longer be friends. What if they decide to sell and you end up with new owners or someone inherits the property? Will you get along in the future with other owners? So let's also talk about landlocked land. Now that's a tongue twister. Don't say that too fast. So you're searching the internet and you notice a fantastic price on a piece of land that you just have to have. You actually go out to the property. You drive down the road. You even manage to walk on the property with no problem. But you may not have access to the road. It might be a private road that you just traveled on. So when you're researching these properties, make sure it's not landlocked. I've seen it before. People think they're getting a great deal, 
But once they get a complete survey and they get some title work done, it ends up being completely landlocked, which is, in my opinion, pretty much useless land at this particular point. I know it's a long process and a costly process, but one that must be done. Also, when you're looking at a piece of land, don't assume to know the zoning of a specific area. A piece of land may look like residential, but it could be commercial or agriculture. Never assume, especially if you intend on building a home on that particular piece of land. Now, most cities and counties have online assistance to help you find out the correct zoning. You could also email the local planning and zoning department. They're usually very helpful. I've worked with them many times and they always get some great information. A couple years ago, I came across a piece of property and it looked like it was agricultural. It was actually being used as farm ground. So was the ground next to it and the ground next to that and the ground next to that. But I later found out that on the city's master plan that they intend for that whole row of property in the future to be commercial slash industrial. Now they may let you build a house on that property, but in the future, the neighbors could potentially build something that is commercial, like a hotel, a gas station, a car wash, something that you probably do not want as your neighbor. Since we're on the topic of zoning, let's say you're out there driving around looking at some land and you come across a house here, a house there, a house down the road, and then you come across a piece of land that's for sale and you find out it's zoned commercial or agricultural, well, there's a possibility you could get it rezoned to residential. You could take the plat map to the local planning and zoning department that the land falls under and apply for a rezone. Now, each area will have its own set procedure on what needs to be done. But in general, most of the time, it will go in front of the planning and zoning committee. Once it gets approved there, it will then go to the city council meeting for approval. You must get the approval before any home is built on the land. And by the way, these meetings are open to the public and anyone can attend, and they can also object to your rezone request. Let's say, for instance, all the properties around you are zoned residential and yours is commercial. You probably have a high probability of it being rezoned. But let's say that the property around you is residential and you want a rezone to commercial, honestly, it will be an uphill battle and you may have to hire a real estate attorney to help you. Wetlands. First off, what are they? It's areas where water covers the soil. It can be on top of the soil or it can be near the top of the soil. Sometimes you do not see it. This water can be there for the whole year, but sometimes it can be there part of the year. Now there is a map to give you a little bit of help. If you go to fws.gov, you can find your property on the wetlands mapper. So search for your property by address or even use the zoom function on the map. If your land shows up on the map as wetlands, there's a good chance that the land is wetland property. So if you plan on building on the property and it appears to be wetland property, the first thing you need to do is clear the wetlands. This usually involves hiring a wetland engineer. There will be two outcomes. It'll be wetland property or it is not. If it shows no wetlands, the report does. The next step is to contact the government agency that handles this particular matter, which I believe is the Army Corps of Engineers, and they will take it from there. They'll either come out and do their own tests or they will use the engineer's reports. If the property turns out to be wetland property, your wetland engineer should be able to make some suggestions on what you can do with the property. So I had a case similar to this a few years ago, north of Salt Lake City, um, close to Brigham City, Utah. It was a five acre piece of property. And on the wetland mapper, it showed that part of the property possibly was wetland property. So the people hired a wetland engineer. He went out there and he determined that two acres of the property were wetlands. It happened to be the front two acres. This property was more narrow and then deep. And there was two options. We could either find somebody who would want to swap wetland property for non-wetland property or use just part of the land. And since it was the front section of the land that seemed to be wetlands, there wasn't many options. I was joking we could build a bridge and an engineer said that is actually one of your best options. 
the people decided to walk away from the property. So you find this ideal piece of property and it's say five or six acres or maybe 10 acres. And you had the idea, well, I'll subdivide the land. I'll give a piece to my brother, my sister, my nephew, and a piece to Mike. Well, hold on a minute. There may be requirements on how much land has to be with each structure. There may be regulations that state one home per 10 acres, one home per five acres, or maybe one home per one acre. In order to change this requirement, you have to go back to the Planning and Zoning Committee and seek a change. Utilities. I always say that the best piece of land to buy is a piece that already has utilities on it. Bringing in gas, electric, sewer can be very, very expensive. Sometimes just driving to the land, you can get an idea of what is available at the local site. If you do not see any utilities, call the city water department. They can help determine if there is water and sewer going down the street and how far away you are from the closest source of water and sewer. It will give you an idea how far you may have to go to bring those particular utilities. But also when you're at the land, look and see if there's any power poles. If there's none available, you may have to contact the local power company and see what they allow. Usually the cheapest way for power is to run overhead power lines. If you have to dig underground power lines, it can get a little bit on the expensive side, but the power company can help determine what you will exactly need. Oh, I can't forget fire hydrant. And you think, why would you ask that, Mike? Well, if you plan on building a home on that property, you may need the approval of the fire department in order to get the building permit. So find out where the closest fire hydrant is and contact the local fire marshal or the local fire chief to get an idea of what the requirements are for you to build a home on that land. I actually know of a home that had no fire hydrant on the street. And in order to get the building permit, the fire department required a fire hydrant. So the new homeowner had to either run lines like a mile down the road to put a fire hydrant in, or install an underground tank. They decided to install a 20,000 gallon underground tank. And there's a fire hydrant that sits on the top. It even has a float system so that the fire department can drive by and they can see if the tank is empty or full. If you would drive by that home today, you would think that it was a standard fire hydrant and not realize there's a 20,000 gallon tank underground. That system was very expensive. Also, when you're looking for land, especially if you work from home, Make sure there is good internet service in the area, and you might also want to find out what the cell phone service is like. So you're looking for a really good deal. Well, a few years ago, there was a bunch of land for sale on eBay that you could buy lots for $5,000, $4,000. So I was curious. Well, the lots were located in Box Elder County, which is the northwest part of the state. Well, I had to take a drive out there. I drove on paved roads as far as I could go. Then I had to travel on some poorly maintained dirt roads for another 50 to 60 miles until I finally arrived at the lots. When I got there, the truck was full of dirt. Well, I thought it was a big disappointment. There was no utilities for miles and miles. It was basically desert land. And I had no idea what I would do with the land. I thought about making it a camping site, but I wasn't a fan of driving 50 to 60 miles on a dirt road and have my camper trailer and my truck full of dirt. So I ended up passing on the land. Well, they sold lot after lot, I imagine, to many buyers who never visited the property. So I was curious, do they still put that land for sale on eBay? So I did a quick search on good old eBay and I found 40 acres with a current bid of $2,000. So there you go. You can own 40 acres of remote vacant land, probably for $2,000, $3,000, $4,000, depends where the bidding ends, but I would recommend driving out there first. And one more thing, owner finance properties. You can find them on sites like Craigslist and many other sites, but be very cautious. I've seen times where the seller of the property is not the owner of the property and you will end up paying that individual monthly payments for land that they do not own. So if you're considering owner finance land, go to a title company and make sure you know everything about the property. Also, do me a favor, 
Let me know in the comments down below if any of this information was helpful. And in summary, that's some of my tips when you are going to purchase some land. If you have any kind of questions, by all means, reach out to me. Glad to answer anything that I can. Until the next video, take care and stay safe.